Can you grab a Bible, please, and um, turn to Acts chapter 2, which is the famous Pentecost passage, but also only one of several passages we're going to look at today. And I'm just going to start um, with, um, well, that's where we're going to start, and we might end up there as well. So um, welcome again if you're visiting. We're in the middle of a core series. This is week 23, and on Pentecost Sunday, I thought it was appropriate to say that our core statement today is that at St. Philip's, we pray for revival. So here is chapter 2 of Acts, starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own or her own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his or her own native tongue? Jump to verse 12 and do not look at Graham. Thank you, Graham. Stagehand. Yeah, come on. Woohoo! Thanks, G. Legend. Verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Clearly, they had not been to Twickenham. Premiership final. No, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Come on. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be? Come on. Boom. As you know, um, this is the word of the Lord. As you know, on Tuesday mornings, uh, about 20, 25 of us gather every week to pray for revival here at St. Philip's. Everyone's welcome. It's not a new prayer meeting. Um, people have prayed, I think, on Tuesday mornings for years here at St. Philip's, um, and it's an awesome legacy. Uh, uh, the current format is just part of a bigger story, but perhaps, perhaps maybe what marks this season is that in this season, we are specifically, you know, we're just going after revival every week. And our overarching desire is that God sends his spirit, not that he hasn't already. It's just that we want a greater and greater measure until we are filled to overflowing and permanently on fire with devotion and ministry and mission and joy and glory. We want to see a move of God in these days in this church. And our prayer is the prayer of Habakkuk 3.2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. And I want to say a massive thank you to those of you who are able to come. Not everyone can, obviously, on a Tuesday. Just to partner with us on that, that's brilliant. I've loved it. I've loved the last couple of years. On the 14th of February 2021, I preached a sermon on God's promise of personal spiritual revival from Isaiah 57. And it said this, And it will be said, Build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. For this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I will live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And that was the passage I preached on on that day. The very next morning, I felt the Lord tell me to lead Tuesday's prayer meeting that week in revival prayer. That was the 16th of February, 2021, and we haven't stopped since. Whatever topic we pray for, we pray for it in the context of praying revival. 
And in the early days, we were, we were actually we were in lockdown at the time still, so we were on Zoom, and we spent each Tuesday looking at a, a historic revival. So we looked at the great awakenings of the 18th and 19th centuries in the United States, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, tens of millions coming to faith in America and Europe, new ministries, new churches, new mission organizations. 1904, the Welsh Revival, Evan Roberts, 100,000 coming to faith in less than a year, spread to Scandinavia, North America, India, parts of Africa and Asia. We looked at 1906 through to 1915, the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles when the gift of tongues was returned to the church, revived in the church. The Pentecostal movement was born. Uh, One of the leaders in that particular revival was Pastor William J. Seymour, and he uh, writes this of the moment revival broke out. He says, suddenly, Acts 2, <laughs> as though hit by a bolt of lightning, we were knocked from our chairs to the floor, and the other seven men with me began to speak in tongues and shout out loud, praising God. Just like Acts 2, the city was stirred, crowds gathered, services were moved outside because they couldn't fit them into the buildings. People fell down under the power of God as they approached. They got baptized in the spirit. The sick were healed, sometimes very dramatically with insane stories like arms growing back that had been cut off. Uh, 1921, the Fisherman's Revival in Suffolk. Who's heard of that one? (laughs) Massive on the word and the cross. Fishermen coming into Lowestoft Harbor, coming under the power of God, conviction of sin, leaving their fish in their boats to go and find a church. (laughs) <laughs> Come on. Spread up the sort of east coast of England and reach Scotland. 1970, the first Asbury revival that kick-started the Jesus movement on the west coast of America. Anyone remember that? The Jesus people or the Jesus freaks, as the media called them. Calvary Chapel, Vineyard, Jesus Culture, Hillsong, all trace their roots to that revival. 1994, the Father's Heart revival in Toronto, which spread across the world, came to Bath, hit churches in Bath, particularly Life Church or Bath City Church, if you know it. The revival of worship and miracles, manifestations of God's power, prophecy and sonship. What a revival! Most recently, February of this year, Asbury again in Kentucky, marked by young people worshiping and worshiping for days without stopping, people traveling from all over the world, queuing outside the church, simplicity, humility, salvations, healings, deliverance from addictions. And when we were looking through these historical um, uh, revivals, of which those were only a few, We noted that on every occasion, the great move of God started with a small group of people who dedicated themselves to pray. Often through the night, often for long periods of time. Dedication, faith, fervor for the spirit to come. Like of all the stuff we do in church, what becomes most important is that the spirit would be poured out. Until the dam breaks and the churches fill up with people who have come under the power and glory and holiness of God. Early on in the journey, um, one of the things that came out in a prayer meeting is that we felt the Lord say that before we were to pray for revival, he wanted us to pray for the conditions required for revival. And at one point, I remember when we were still in lockdown, we spent three weeks praying three prayers, nine prayers over three weeks to prepare the way for ourselves and also on behalf of all of you. We prayed that God would bring us to a deep conviction of sin. We prayed that we would come before him with genuine repentance, that God would awaken spiritual hunger in this church, that he would draw us to fervent intercession, that this church would be marked by loving unity, that he would fill us with a passion to see people saved, he would give us a desire for mission, that he would pour out his spirit to sanctify us and make us holy. And that last prayer has been one that we've returned to a number of times because we're aware that Holiness is necessary if we're to have communion with Holy Spirit, to bear the weight of the glory of God's presence. And, um, you know, I've often reflected that um, revival is, is a very costly thing because it requires us to die. There is, of course, life and joy and celebration in the Spirit, but in order to attain the fullness of God, we have to die. Lots of Christians, I think, seem to forget that, you know? They want the resurrection, but you can't have a resurrection without a cross. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. 
but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other translations, it says, it's not I that lives, but Christ in me. It's not I that lives, but Christ in me. The preoccupation with self has to die if you want revival. Unholy patterns of self-centered living have to die if you want revival. Addictions to immoral attitudes to sex have to die if you want revival. In order to experience the holiness and power of God, you have to die to self. This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 to 8. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Unholiness is a rejection of God, and you can't have revival if you reject God. The call to holiness is not about moral teaching, it's about whether we're fit to host the holy fire presence of God himself, the God who brings revival. So I'm still talking about the prayer meeting. So I feel like the culture that we have had in the prayer meeting, um, I mean, there are are 24 people here who who might say, I don't don't recognize what Paul's talking about at all, but this is what I feel. I feel we have a culture in our prayer meeting in which like faith has risen for the kingdom to advance. That prophetic words and pictures have revealed the Father's heart to us. And that we've often moved actually from petitions to declarations of supernatural intervention. There's been a shift in this prayer meeting, I love it. It's a fiery meeting, it's the best prayer meeting I've ever been to, it's never ever boring. And as I've said before, I have become convinced that everything we have seen God do here in the last few years, from healings, physical healings here at the front of church or in home groups, to momentum and mission, from salvations to the level of unity that we're walking in at the moment as a church is all because we are praying for revival at St. Philip's and awakening in Ardan. We've prayed revival for the church, its mission for Matt 22, for our kids and youth, for spiritual hunger, for awakening in our streets, for salvations, for healings, for holiness, that St. Philip's would be a dwelling place in which manifest presence of God is measurably discernible. We've prayed up, and we've prayed in, and we've prayed out. We've prophesied, we've worshipped, we've given tongues, we've given translations for those tongues. We've had pictures and angelic visitations for those who can see in the Spirit. We've had prophetic words that have included beacons and wells and rivers, lions, green shoots, righteous oaks, tilled earths, tilled earth, seeds, dry bones, umbilical cords, fire, water, scrolls, lights, swords, armies, lifeboats, lighthouses, robes, mantles, anointings, legislative authorities, crowns, kings, and overshadowing wings. We've declared salvation for people we don't know. We've called for the breaking of addictions. We've prayed for manifestations of the Holy Spirit and God's love to actually manifest in people's living rooms who don't know him in Oddan. We've prayed for schools, local businesses, charities. We've prayed for church events and volunteer teams, for the sick and the distraught and the bereaved. And into every situation the prayer has been, Lord, send revival because your Holy Spirit is the solution for everything. Wow, come on. Okay, I will. Ah, sorry. Actually, not sorry. You'll be aware frequently in the Old Testament when the prophets spoke of um, water in particular, streams and rivers and springs and rain and dew, they're speaking to the barrenness of the human heart and the promise of solution. No matter what Israel was facing, military threat, their own sin, disease, whatever the problem was, when God brought a promise, it frequently was accompanied with water. Whenever water is mentioned, it's, it's representative of the Holy Spirit. You know, no matter the problem, God's solution was the outpouring of his presence. The early and latter rain, the streams in the desert, the rivers of blessing. They're prophecies of God releasing his presence and power as the one fix for everything. Uh, the, the testimony is that the increase of his presence is the solution. Listen to this. It's a prophecy that reveals the pattern of revival. Isaiah 35, it will come up on the screen. The desert 
and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance and divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, jackals, jackals, jackals once lay, Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. Let's unpack that little passage. Verses 1 and 2. Tim, can you just go back to 1 and 2? To the barren land, God's presence will cause an overflow of abundance until his splendor is revealed. Verses 3 and 4. The promise comes with a commission to God's people to declare the coming river. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the weak knees, speak strength to fearful hearts, tell them that God himself will come to save them. That is the witness of a believer who believes in the promise. Because someone whose life is immersed in hope is someone who is able to come to a person with no hope and declare the reality, the superior reality of heaven. Then verses five to six articulate what happens when revival comes. Eyes are opened, deaf ears are healed, the lame leap, the mute shout for joy as the river gushes forth. It's abundance, power, salvation, liberation, vindication, restoration, fullness of joy, adoption for the orphan spirit, comfort for the bereaved. The presence of God is literally the solution for everything. That's why we pray for revival here at St. Philip's. I mean, that's what I, I mean. You could, have, you could have something else if you want, but that, I'm up for that. Just so we're all clear, when I talk about revival, I don't mean a moment of reviving as some define it. It's easy when you look at those past revivals and say, yeah, revival is a moment. It's a period of time. I, I don't mean that. I mean it's a permanent state of being alive in the Spirit. It's when God continually pours out his Spirit to revitalize, which means fortify, strengthen, help, bolster, sustain, bring life to his church. A revival isn't life support for an ailing church. It's the flow of life to a vibrant church. It's not a short burst to keep us going for a bit longer until we get tired again. It's meant to be the steady state of being filled by the presence, power, and love of God. Anyone experience that? Your life's never the same again. You're wrecked for the presence of God. This is what Bill Johnson says. He says that revival is meant to lead to reformation. It's not a flash in the pan. It's meant to lead to reformation. In other words, everything we do, we do in and through and because of the power of the Spirit. Revival as a culture. This is what Paul says in Ephesians 5.18. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's in Scripture. Get on with it then. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. As you've heard me say before, he's not talking about conversion in that point. He's talking about the continuous infilling of the Holy Spirit as a lifestyle of revival. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, present continuous tense, continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit. Get plugged in to the IV of heaven. That was the pattern of the early church. And if you want to know what the result was, read the rest of the book of Acts. And if you're new to the faith and you haven't read it yet, I'll give you a heads up. It's not about cake sales, fundraisers, and litter picks. 
revival culture, a biblical lifestyle. So when we ask Holy Spirit to come and he comes, we honor him and we host his presence. We don't say, okay, we've got the spirit now, let's get on with mission, disastrous theology. We say, thank you, Father, for the precious gift of your presence. I'm gonna dedicate my life to honoring your presence and learning how to harness it, the anointing that you've placed on my life so that I can glorify you through my life. Please increase now the measure of your spirit on me and on this church. That's, what, that's the response. When you get a touch of God, that's the response. Thank you, please more. I'll do everything I can so that your presence won't lift off me. I'll do everything I can to increase the oil of your anointing. It's how we learn to live out of the overflow, out of rest, not striving, out of anointing, not fleshly gifting, out of his leading, not our own strategies. Revival is about the yes that we're willing to give to the agenda of heaven. It's the yes to the more of God than anything else. It's the yes to God getting his way here and in our lives. And what happens in a revival church is that um, God... Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the things of heaven move front and center. There's like a heightened awareness of the agenda of the king and his kingdom. That's why revival churches are more impressed with the things of heaven than the things of the world. Quite often the things of institutional church. They're just more impressed with heaven. So worship starts to become a priority because all eyes are fixed on the Lamb. Prophecy starts to increase because everyone's ears are resting on the chest of Jesus. Healing starts to manifest because everyone starts to share the Father's opinion of illness and sickness. A mission starts to explode because the overflow becomes uncontainable. And as his people are filled, he brings personal revival. They get healed, encouraged, filled with love. They get an identity upgrade. Their false impressions of who God is are corrected. The religious spirit falls away and with it all of its filthy ugh, obligation and guilt and, and the orphan spirit and patterns of worship and ministry that have no power to them. And in its place, the spirit of adoption reveals to believer the uncomplicated, unhindered, surprisingly joyful and loving affection that God has for them. What a life. I mean, a Christian like, a Christian like that is great news for the world terrible news for the devil revival always brings personal liberation and I, I mean look I want to be personally liberated into everything that Jesus blood paid for that whole thing of you know Christians who believe enough to get saved but not enough to be dangerous I don't want that because <sighs> you know personal liberation is necessary for a life to truly witness who Jesus is. He fills us so we can leak him. He restores us so we can restore others. He blesses us so we can bless others. And he saves us so that others can see what salvation actually looks like. So revival is essential for a church to be alive. And alive churches, they just, they can't help it. They bring life to others. Dead churches bring life to no one. And it begins with our yes. It begins when our yes gets greater weight than every other desire, every other issue and fear and question, theology, church activity, money, status, reputation, any other idol, resentment, unforgiveness, sense of entitlement, approval, every other thing that wars against the utter, undisputed, undiluted sovereignty, presence, power of Jesus Christ. It's the abandoned yes to the cost of everything. I mean, you know, in prayer meeting, I think we're just starting. Just starting to realize what it is we're praying for and the implications of what it is we're praying for. I'm going to wrap up with Acts 2, back to Acts 2. So, as you know, um, Pentecost is the day when Jesus kept the ultimate promise in Scripture. Scripture is full of God's promises, 
and full of God's promises being fulfilled. In fact, Scripture tells us that every promise God has ever made is yes and amen in Jesus. But the greatest promise of Scripture is that Jesus would send his Spirit. That was the purpose of the cross. Let's not get it wrong. That was the purpose of the cross. The cross killed the sin so that we could have life in him. And the life in him that the scriptures witness to is life in the spirit. The intimate communion that comes with the indwelling of God's holy presence in his holy people. Right, so left to sin, we cannot have the Holy Spirit dwell in us. Saved from sin, we are liberated into a dynamic life in which the kinetic power of of God can dwell in us and flow through us. That was John the Baptist's testimony. His message was repent and be baptized. That wasn't his whole message. His complete message was, I'll baptize you with water, but there'll be one who's coming who'll baptize you with the Spirit and fire. In other words, John, who Jesus said was the greatest of all prophets, was prophesying not just that sins would be forgiven, but that the spirit baptizer was coming. That's why John's so preoccupied with the forgiveness of sins. It's why he's calling people to repentance. It's why his ministry is genuinely a ministry of preparing the way. Jesus, the Son of God, was about to open the way for you and me to receive the infilling and habitation of the Holy Spirit. The greatest promise of all, which is why we read in John 16, 7, just before he ascends, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. We have to understand the significance of that statement, right? The disciples have just experienced the joy of Jesus returning to them. Every shred of doubt, fear, and regret has gone. They're bursting with love for their Savior. They're ready to serve him to the ends of the earth. There's nothing more that they would love than for him to continue to stay with them and walk with them. But what does Jesus do? He says, I'm gone. Because there's something better than being in the room with him. There's something better than being in the presence of Jesus in the flesh, and it's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The highest desire of the Spirit baptizer. So they watch him ascend, and they then do what he told them to do. They wait, and they worship, and they pray, and they gather in unity and devotion, and then they receive the promise. Because in a moment, suddenly, one morning at 9 a.m. in the upper room, the Spirit falls on them, and they receive the power of heaven. And immediately, all heaven breaks loose. The manifestations of supernatural wind and fire. 3,000 people come to faith. They speak in languages they've not been taught. That 3,000 people, they get baptized. The disciples are never the same again. And many of their exploits are, are described in, in the rest of the book of Acts. And it, it, it looks like healings and salvations and supernatural jailbreaks and moving to and fro in the spirit. Visions, delivering people from demonic oppression, raising the dead. The spirit enabled them to do exactly what Jesus did because the same power that had raised him from the dead had taken up residence in them. That's why we pray for revival at St. Philip's. We want Jesus to get the opportunity to fulfill his promise in us. According to Acts 2, the church is not the church if it isn't fully focused on, fully engaged with, fully obedient to, and fully filled with the Holy Spirit. And at St. Philip's, we want to be a church. And if it's heaven's call, you can't be effective in it if you don't have the power of heaven. You can be busy doing other things. But if it's heaven's call, it's got to look like heaven. So we pray. 
we pray for St. Philip's to be flooded with the water of the Spirit. Someone gave me a picture this morning. They saw a flood measuring stick on the side of that wall over there, like the one you see at Wellow Ford or other places. And marked on it were where the Spirit had been in the past. And their reflection was how much more there is to come. We pray for this church to be set on fire with the holy fire of God. We pray for signs and wonders that witness to the goodness of God beyond our own capability that he would witness to himself the supernatural reality of a supernatural God. We pray for a move that will cause the salvation of many. And we pray that this would be a church that allows him to bear witness to himself. Which is why I believe that since we've started praying for revival, We've seen stuff in our midst this year, new levels of encounter and worship, physical healings, several supernatural salvations where God did it, not us. Oh, I'd love a church to be like that. I'd love a church to be like that. Hmm. I could say more. I felt the Lord just say, don't. The imparting of spiritual gifts, prophetic insights, the ministry of angels. We've, so I honor Holy Spirit this Pentecost Sunday. I thank him for the life that he brings. I thank the Lord that we have seen his goodness in the land of the living this year. We say we've heard your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds. So we pray again, repeat them in our day, in our time, in our church. In our neighborhood and our city, make them known for your glory. Amen.